This is the story for Public Airways, Flight 4439. America is a strange country when it comes to aviation. It has rules that in other countries would just be weird. For instance, the regional airlines often take on the branding of their larger full-service brothers and operate low-demand routes to far-flung parts of the country. But the most interesting thing about all of this is the size of the jets that these regional airlines are allowed to operate, that is, legally allowed. The scope clause limits the size of these jets to about 86,000 pounds. That is why Republic Airways was operating this flight from Atlanta to, well, the report doesn't really say where the flight was headed to, but it was just said that the incident happened near Atlanta. But other sources that I've consulted said that this flight was headed to New York's LaGuardia. So that's what we're going with. Although I wonder why a flight to New York from Atlanta of all places had only six people on board as passengers. If you have any idea about this, please do let me know in the comments below. Well, on that day, the jet lined up with runway 9 left at Atlanta and the pilots pushed the engines to max power and they were rolling down the runway. Within moments, they were airborne as flight 4439 left Atlanta and gained altitude. The pilots decided that they were now going to engage the autopilot, but for some weird reason, the autopilot just would not come out. But that wasn't all. The pilots figured out that they were having some control issues with the airplane. It was pitching up way more than they expected the plane to at this point in the flight. It was as if the plane had a mind of its own. The pilots immediately knew that they had a pitch trim runaway. So what is trim? It was basically a way for the pilots to automatically adjust the control surfaces on the plane so that the pilot does not really have to constantly provide a control input. For example, Take the situation where one of your engines flames out or fails. The plane now wants to yaw in one direction. In this case, you can trim the rudder to counteract this yaw. In the case of Republic Airways Flight 4439, this trim system seemed to have a mind of its own pushing the nose of the plane up. When this happens, it's known as a pitch trim runaway. If you paid attention to the MAX crisis, this is what a lot of the pilots thought that they were dealing with. Obviously, pilots are trained to handle this for the captain, his training kicked in, and he held the trim disconnect button down on his side. Theoretically, this should have told the trim system to knock it off, but the plane still wanted to pitch up. The captain asked the first officer to try the pitch disconnect from his side, but still nothing. The plane wanted to pitch up, and the pilot struggled to keep the nose down. The pilots knew that they were in deep trouble and immediately declared an emergency, letting the controllers know that they had a trim runaway. These pilots needed to land ASAP, and the controllers offered up runway 10 for them. The pilots decided to go for it. The situation in the cockpit was so bad that both pilots were pushing down on the yoke, meaning that neither of them could get to the quick reference handbook to troubleshoot the issues. The only line of defense that they had was their wits and experience. The tower then asked if they needed to go higher to troubleshoot the problem. Then seconds ticked by with no answer, and then a transmission came in. Brickyard 4439 were in a stalling situation. The pilots were quite literally fighting for their lives with a plane that just did not want to respond to their commands. ATC now knew that whatever was happening with Flight 4439 was serious, and they started clearing the airspace around the runway. This was so that they could give Flight 4439 a straightened approach should they need that. They also stopped departures to give the E-175 some maneuvering room and to prevent a potential collision should the E-175 lose control. As all of this was happening, the pilots in the cockpit were trying to descend, but they still did not have luck. The pilots, now having gotten back some control of their plane, asked what runway was available. The controller let them know that runway 10 was all theirs, and they were more than willing to get anybody and everybody out of the way to make any other runway at Atlanta available for them. As a side note, I personally love it when in a situation like this, ATC and everyone else in the air is just so willing to get anyone in the sky who's in trouble down in one piece. I love that sort of camaraderie. The pilots of Flight 4439 decided to shoot for runway 10. In the cockpit, the pilots realized that they were able to have some pitch authority using the first officer's pitch trim button. With the plane under control, well, somewhat, they took the jet down to 6,000 feet. But the plane wasn't going to comply without a fight. On the controller's radar scopes, the controllers could see that the jet was climbing again. On the display, they saw the values tick up slowly as the jet climbed again. This was becoming the roller coaster ride from hell. On the ground, the fire chief was briefed about the plane that was coming in so that they could have some plan should the worst come to pass. 
The pilots fought with the plane stabilizing it around 10,000 feet and they searched for runway 10. The pilots had gotten the plane south of the airport and they were now so close that all they needed to do was make a right turn and line the jet up. Easier said than done in a plane that would barely respond to your controls. The tower by this time had someone else on the frequency that flew the 175, ready to offer assistance to the crew of flight 4439. But they seemed to be doing okay for the time being. With the plane seemingly under control, they made that right turn to line up with the runway. Within minutes, they were cleared for the localizer for runway 10 and they were descending. The controllers kept the runway just off to the left of runway 10 open as well, just in case flight 4439 couldn't make the turn for 10. But all was well and the jet landed safely on runway 10 with no issues and everyone breathed a sigh of relief. So that begs the question, how did a modern jetliner almost lose control and stall out over Atlanta? If you're a plane nerd, and I'm going to assume that you are because you're watching this with me, then this might seem very similar to the 737 MAX crisis from a couple of years ago. Well, that was due to there only being one angle of attack sensor and it being faulty and the software not being robust enough to deal with that. In addition to that, the 737 MAX had even more software that Boeing had added to make the new 737 MAXs fly like older 737s. As we'll see, the case of Flight 4439 would be different. When the investigators got their hands on this plane, they started to go through it with a fine tooth comb. They probably looked at control surfaces of the jet to make sure that everything moved according to expectations. They probably looked at the automation to make sure that everything was working as intended. But the jet looked okay and airworthy. There seemed like there was nothing that would make it go haywire when it was airborne. That was until they looked at the control column on the captain's side. You see, the control column funneled a group of wires through into the flight deck so that it can eventually be fed into the flight computers on this aircraft. And they noticed something weird. The wires that control the horizontal stabilizer actuator and the wires of the autopilot trim disconnect button were found to be chafed. Well, as it turned out, there was a bolt right where these cables were routed to, and the bolt had this tiny bit of wire on the end of it called a safety wire, and it turned out that, ironically enough, the end of the safety wire was not tucked in properly and was sticking out, allowing it to rub up against the wire bundle. So every time the plane took off, landed, turned in the sky, experienced some turbulence, the end of the wire would rub up against these wires, slowly whittling the insulation away. If this isn't the perfect conditions for a short circuit, then I don't know what is. This could have easily messed with the signals that the trim system was sending to the computers, which explained the aggressive pitch-ups, but also why the captain's side trim did not work. With this now being known, Republic Airways decided to have all of its E-175s looked at to see if their wires were intact. Shockingly, nine other planes in the Republic fleet were found to have damaged wires which were damaged in this exact same way. A wider inspection of the fleet of E-175s in the US found one more affected plane. This meant that some process in the factory of Embraer in Brazil was not following orders correctly, but that could be fixed. The more interesting thing here that I'd like to look at is how the pilots handle this emergency. Having your plane pitch up right after takeoff can be a harrowing experience, and it required some skillful flying to get this plane on the ground. I mean, it's hard imagining the amount of force it would take to fight against a plane that wanted to go up no matter what. I found this comment from someone who was purportedly on Flight 4439 underneath another YouTube video about this incident. I have no way of verifying this person's account, so take it with a grain of salt. Quote, I was one of the six passengers on that flight that day. I am an avid follower of this channel and I have studied a lot of incidents. Couldn't believe that it happened to me. I knew something was wrong the second we took off. I thanked the pilots that day that saved my life. They looked absolutely exhausted and in shock when they came out of the cockpit. I shook both their hands and I wish I can contact them again to tell them how much I appreciate how amazing they were. It was definitely the scariest thing I've ever experienced." End quote. From what I read about this accident, all of that absolutely tracks. Looking at this incident a little bit closer, these pilots were kind of robbed of the ability to fight this fight. You see, for each plane, you have what are known as memory items. If things go south, 
These are a couple of items that you need to be able to remember off of the top of your head to immediately deal with the situation. So, for instance, on the 737, if you have an engine fire, you need to turn off the auto throttle, close the throttle, set the start lever to cut off, and pull the fire switch. You need to do all of these from memory. No looking up checklists, no nothing. In the case of the pitch trim runaway, in the Republic checklist, it had one item. Hold the autopilot slash trim disconnect button. That's it. In this case, the pilots had their hands so full that they couldn't even reach for the QRH to see what else they needed to do. But they found out that Embraer's memory items called for the pilots to press the autopilot slash trim disconnect button on both sides and not just the captain's side. Had both checklists been the same, the pilots could have gotten the plane under control a lot sooner. These guys knew what they were doing and they were able to figure out that they needed to try the other side as well. I hate to think what could have happened if the crew were less experienced. Think back to the Lion Air 737 MAX incident. In that case, the software commanded a dive on a previous flight, and in that case, the pilots figured out that hitting the stab trim cutout would solve their problem. The crew of Lion Air 610, the flight that crashed, unfortunately did not. What I'm trying to say is, this was way too close for comfort, and it's a real miracle that nothing went too wrong. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. I'll catch you guys next time. Stay safe.